Welcome, friends. Thanks for tuning in to Christ St. Paul's Sunday Sermon. We're glad you're here. We'll begin with our gospel reading. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. This is the 21st chapter, beginning at verse 28. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said to the same. And he answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? And they said, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax, the tax collectors and the prostitutes will go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. The Holy Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would take this word, take these words of mine and the meditations of our hearts, Lord, as we reflect on them, that they might be pleasing to you. And Lord, that your word to us this morning might work for our transformation. Lord, that we would always be willing to seek repentance, to turn and to live. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> One of the most comforting verses in Scripture to me is Romans chapter 7, verse 15. This is that verse when Paul says, I know what I am supposed to do. I know what is right, yet I don't do it. I know what I ought to do, but I do the thing that I hate. Now, let me explain why this is a comforting verse to me. Because it was the Apostle Paul that said this. Not, not a 13-year-old boy rebelling against his parents. We would expect that of an adolescent. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't do it. We don't expect this of a man who is at the height of his religious and spiritual experience. But if we're honest, we know exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about. We know what we are supposed to do. Well, let me, let me speak for myself in this. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what is expected of me. I know what is right to do, whether at work, whether at school, whether at home, wherever. I know what is right to do, but I rather end up doing something else. Maybe I find a different way of doing it, or maybe I, I just don't do it altogether, and I simply hope no one notices, or that it doesn't make a big enough splash that, that people can find out. And I know that we often might think that this is simply a non-Christian problem, because I know it's hard to believe that Christians struggle with sin. We too struggle with doing the right things. And now I know that you're thinking, thank goodness he said that. Thank goodness he said that. I thought I was the only one who struggled with this kind of thing. No? No, you're, you're not special in this way. You're not, the, you're not the only one who doesn't have a flawless integrity or perfect obedience record. All right, we're all flawless when it comes to this. Or we're all flawed when it comes to this, sorry. 
And now again, I know what you're thinking again. Now, Pastor, I came to church to be encouraged, <laughs> not, to be, not to be told how flawed I am. Well, it's going to get a little bit darker before it gets better, but I promise the encouragement is coming. Right, the same man, the Apostle Paul, who confessed that he doesn't always do what he should or that what he knows is right, he goes on to say that no one is righteous, no, not one. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Right, there it is. We are at the bottom. Everybody knows we are in the same pool. We're all flawed. No one can point to their perfect obedience record. No one can say that they are flawless with integrity. We're all here. But that same man in the same breath that he just said also said, but God does not treat us as we deserve. He accepts us and he forgives our sins. This is starting to get better. See, this is the good news for anyone who is willing to acknowledge the truth about the bad news. Good news is only good if we know that there is bad news. If we acknowledge the bad news, we can look to that good news and say, ah, this is good news. This is good news. So is anyone to acknowledge the truth of the bad news? God has not condemned us as he could, but rather he has set us free through and in the person of Jesus. Now, this is such good news if we can let ourselves see the truth and seek repentance. All of the passages today in the lectionary that we heard read point to this reality of changing our direction through the power of the Holy Spirit and taking on a new form of life in the kingdom of God. And as we have been following Jesus through the gospel of Matthew, we have been made witnesses to the Messiah's healing, his many miracles, his teaching and his instruction on, on what the kingdom of God is and how we are to live in the kingdom of God. He has also revealed himself as the king and he has also revealed himself on how we are to enter the kingdom of God. That is, through belief in him as the Messiah and the acknowledgement and the repentance of our sin. This is the entrance into the kingdom of God. One of the key features of Jesus' journey, as we find in the Gospels, is the movement from Jesus' early ministry in the area of Galilee and his growing pop, um, popularity and his journey towards Jerusalem, where that growing popularity is going to cause him to clash and have confrontation with the religious elite and the religious leaders, the, the chief priests and the elders in Jeru Jerusalem that will ultimately lead his taking up the cross and being crucified at the hands of the Romans for our redemption. Right? This, is, this is the great journey that Jesus goes on through the Gospels. But before he dies, he, he comes into Jerusalem and he has this confrontation with the religious leaders and the elders. And this is where we find ourselves in the Gospel passage today where Jesus finds himself in confrontation. And it's not just a, a, a lesson in leadership principles, but it is a greater lesson in this gospel idea, the great scheme of the gospel where we are to engage in God's goodness and his mercy and repent of our sins and be saved. So this confrontation is best understood or this parable that we heard, is best understood in the context. And almost every single time when Jesus gives a parable, he is saying the parable in response to a situation that had just happened. 
Okay, there was a, a situation took place, and Jesus now sees a teaching moment, and Jesus, as a master teacher, uses a parable. And so he uses this parable. So we get the context of this parable from the immediate passage preceding it. At verse 23, it says that Jesus entered into the courts, the temple courts. And while he was teaching there, the chief priests and the elders of the people came, and they asked him this question. They said, by what authority are you doing these things? Tell us, who gave you this authority? And Jesus replied pretty snidely. He said, I'll also ask you a question. If you can answer my question, I will tell you from what authority that I am doing these things. Here's the question. John's baptism, was it from heaven or was it from human origin? And so it said that the, the chief priests and the elders, they went and they started to discuss among themselves. They said, if we say from heaven, then he will come back, right back and ask us, well, then why didn't you obey him? But if we say that it is from human origin, we got to watch out because all of the people around us believe that he was a prophet, and they might throw us out. And so they answered Jesus. They said, we don't know. Trying to play it safe. Jesus then responded, responded to them, since you cannot answer my question, I will not answer your question. I will not tell you from where I arrived this authority. Right, so he comes in contact with these, with the chief priests and the elders, and they ask him this question. And so he's coming into conflict with these, with the religious leaders. And because they did not answer his question, they didn't answer his question because they know that they have not obeyed John the Baptist's message. Right? They know that they have not obeyed John the Baptist's message. They are guilty, caught red-handed. And this is the moment that Jesus uses this parable about the two sons that we heard read. Right? One son, the father goes to one son and says, son, go work in the field. And he says, no, don't think so, not going to do it. And then he goes away and he begins to think to himself, Eesh, that probably wasn't right. And the, the, the words in the word for repent is right there. When he said he turned and went to the field and he worked in the field, it means he repented and went to the field. Right, so he repented and went to the field and he worked. The father went to his second son and said the same thing. Hey, go work in the field. And he said, you got it, pop. I'm going to go. But then he did nothing. He did not go into the field. He did not work, right? And so which one of these, Jesus asked, which one of these obeyed the father? Which one of these did the father's will? They have no choice, right, to say, well, it was the one who did what the Father had asked. And in this moment, we can think back to that time when Nathan confronted David, right? And he told him this parable, and he got David all worked up, and David said, that man should be put to death. And then Nathan said, that man is you. This is what Jesus is doing to the religious leaders right here. You are the first son who did not do the Father's will. You have said yes to being the religious leaders. You had said, said yes to being the ones who would guide the people into the way of truth and, and to listen for God's messengers, a.k.a. John the Baptist, and that you would follow the word of the Lord, but you have not done that. You are like the first son who said, or the second son who said, no. Or yes, I'll do it, but then did nothing. You are that person. Jesus is here confronting the religious leaders. And he shows them how they have failed to live up, their, live up to their calling by not paying attention and obeying God's messenger, John the Baptist in this case. Right, the goal of spiritual leadership is is to point people in the right direction towards God through both words and through deeds. 
They can't just sit here and talk about it. They have to actually do it. Right? The, the task of the leader is to speak the truth of God and then to be an example of righteous living. And the religious leaders right here, Jesus has found them to be guilty of failing at both tasks. The religious leaders are like the second son, agreed to do the Father's will, but ended up doing nothing. But what's interesting about this parable that Jesus does at the very end of it, he ends up saying to them, in contrast, actually, sinners and tax collectors and even prostitutes, right? These are the, these are the worst of the worst. They heard John the Baptist's message, and they repented, and they believed. And you saw this happening, and you, you didn't repent and believe? And this is what Jesus has a problem with. He goes on and he tells them, truly I tell you that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. You did not turn and head back into the vineyard to work for God's people. And I think this is the part that sticks out, this final sentence. Even after you saw this, you did not repent and turn and believe him. If, if religious leadership is to do anything, it is to model sensitivity to, to God and to lead the way in repentance. This is what all of us are called to. See, the good news is very good. The gospel is very good news. It does not consider anything in our lives prior to repentance. It doesn't matter how bad you think that you have lived. It doesn't matter how guilty you are for the things that you have done, and it does not matter how much shame you carry for the person you think that you are. All of that has been wiped clean. The scriptures say that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And this, is, this has been always the case. That God, that Yahweh, the God of the Scriptures, has always been slow in his anger. He has always been rich of loving kindness. And this is what we heard all the way back from the prophet Ezekiel in the passages that we heard read today. If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin, they will die for it. Because of the sin that they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness that they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their lives. Because they consider all of the offenses that they have committed and they turn away from them, that person will surely live. They will not die. This is, this is the gospel way back in, in the Old Testament. He goes on to say, repent, turn away from all of your offenses so that the sin in your life may not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all of the offenses that you have committed. Get a new heart and a new spirit. He says that I, will, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone. Repent and live, he says. You see, ultimately, I think that we, we oftentimes miss out on this, this, this part of the Christian life. Oftentimes, we feel like it's a one-time repent thing, and then it's a go and gather up a bunch of good works. Right? So, um, the fruit of our lives is not simply... The fruit of our lives is not simply the, the accomplishment of good works. Right? We can look at all of the good works in our lives and we can say, oh, this is, this is good fruit. Right? I think that we often miss out on the reality that 
the fruit of our lives is often most consistent with our capacity to repent. Our capacity to to be sensitive to God, to recognize where we have fallen short and then turn. That is the base level of, of the fruit of our lives, the ability to repent and to turn and to live. Are we, are we willing to acknowledge our need for God and couple that with the reality that God is good, that He is slow to anger, that He is rich in mercy? His, his mercies are new every morning, the Scriptures say. Are we willing to take our need for God and, and, and apply it to His goodness and His mercy and then come back to Him with arms wide open? We'll find His arms of mercy wide open every single moment. Are we willing to repent, to, to turn, to chart a new path, to head towards God with the help of God? See, I think this is the reason why Paul's, uh, Paul's statement, I, I know what I'm supposed to do, and I can't do it. I tend to always do the thing that I hate to do. This is why it's ultimately encouraging to me. It's because I know I'm not going to do it perfectly. I know that the fruit of my life is consistent with the, with the capacity of my ability to say I have messed up. Forgive me. Turn me by your spirit. Put in me that new heart and that new spirit that I might acknowledge you and move towards you. Ultimately, this, this process of gaining this new heart, this new spirit, is, is God's work in our lives. We can only turn to Him through the power of His Spirit. And then when we turn, when we repent, our prayer is that this new heart and this new spirit would consistently help us take little tiny steps forward more and more towards Christ. And this is what Paul is getting at in Philippians chapter 2, when he says that we ought to have this mind among us, the mind of Christ, the mind that says, um, as Jesus was, the divine, so rich as the divine Son of God that he gave all of that up and became poor for our sake. He goes on to say that don't don't count yourself better than anybody else, but count everybody else as better than you. I think what he's getting at is the reality of a repentant soul. If I am aware of my deep need for God and my consistently um, failing at this part of life, there is no possible chance that I can look out there at all of y'all or look out at anybody else in the community and, 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 and cast judgment. There's no possible chance that I can do that. If I know my deep need for God, then I must only ever pray for yours as well. That you would acknowledge that too. That I might see you all as higher than myself. That you might all see everybody else as higher than yourself because we all know and acknowledge our deep need for God. And we have this when we have the mind of Christ that says, let me be made lower let other people be made higher. This is all a part of that new heart and this new spirit that God spoke of way back in Ezekiel. As we, as we endeavor to follow the Lord, all who have already confessed and brought themselves into relationship with God, who have repented, may as we continue to do that, yes, let us transition our lives and move our lives closer and closer and, and find those good works that God has prepared for us to walk in and to do. But let us also always remain sensitive, sensitive to the fact that we need God. And may if we ever see anybody out there coming and hearing the message of God and repenting, may we also hear the message of God and repent So today, I pray that the Holy Spirit would give us that new heart and that new spirit 
that we would always be consistently and forever um, acknowledging our need for God, resting in His goodness and His mercy, leading the way in that, and then being ever more transformed into the person of Jesus Christ. And so I'll end with the same way that Ezekiel ended. Repent and live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that by your Holy Spirit, that spirit that you have promised to give us, that same spirit that gives us this new heart and this new spirit within us, Lord, ultimately that we can see your loving kindness, that we can recognize your goodness towards all of us. Lord, help us, Lord, to not be offended by your your word to us, Lord, but let us acknowledge our need for you and enter into your mercy. Lord, we thank you for this great gift, this very good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.